What's it like for the world's handful of vegan politicians? Is there a vegan option in elected politics? I met the three vegan members of the British Parliament. In this, the first of two shows, I'll ask about their path to politics. And I'll tell you about vegan politics in the rest of the world. For the first time, we bring them together in one show, as the British members of Parliament get questions from their counterparts in America and India. And I think it's about trying to kind of build that case. I'm Ian MacDonald. And I'm Diana Fleischman. And this is... The Vegan Option. who advocate veganism and hold positions in their national parliament. American Congressman Dennis Kucinich, Indian parliamentarian Monica Gandhi, and the three members from the mother of all parliaments and the nation that invented the word vegan, Britain. Let's introduce them. Firstly, the hunt saboteur. And for those listening, what is a hunt saboteur? Is someone who sabotages hunts. In Britain, that means fox hunts. In the 1970s, uh, fox hunting with hounds was lawful but deeply controversial and people would try to sabotage the hunt by laying false trails and by uh, by distracting with really big noises okay. well so i thought yeah i'm chris williamson then i've been a vegan since uh, the mid 1970s i was just concerned about the cruelty associated with the veal trade really i mean i was a vegetarian first of all um and felt there was some inconsistency, really, between being a vegetarian and continuing to you know, drink dairy products. And it was really on that basis that I decided that it would be the appropriate step to take. It actually coincided with me opening a whole food market stall in Derby's market that year, although I don't think Derby was particularly ready for the whole food revolution in 1978. But... Uh, I gave up alcohol when I was 17, on my 17th birthday. I stopped smoking when I was 18 and became vegetarian when I was 19 and subsequently went on to become a vegan. I also joined the, the Labour Party that year as well. And I was always very clear that uh, it was important to try to influence the you know, mainstream political process, really, to try and uh, you know, make the changes in society that I felt were important. And that whilst there was a role for being involved in single issue organisations like the Hunt Saboteurs Association, the League Against Cool Sports and so on, I was always conscious that we needed to, you know, win that kind of uh, that mainstream political battle. And obviously on the hunting issue, we did manage in the end to get the hunting uh, bill onto the statute book and hunting's now been banned since 2004. That's far better than being a, you know, a hunt saboteur going out week after week to actually make it a criminal offence for people to chase and kill wild animals for fun. The next politician we're going to be talking about is Monica Gandhi, who is a member of Indian Parliament and a part of the Gandhi dynasty. So she's not related to Mahatma Gandhi. That's a very common name in a region of India. Gujarat. But she is the widow of Indira Gandhi's son. That's the matriarch of 20th century Indian politics. And she's focused a lot of her politics on environment and animal welfare. She created India's first animal welfare ministry, and that's the first in the world. She served as its first minister. She banned the use of many different animals for entertainment, and she also made it mandatory for food and cosmetics to be labeled vegetarian or non-vegetarian, both with words and with a color coding scheme. Now, she doesn't always live up to her own standards. She emailed us to tell us that sometimes she eats cake with egg in it if it's gifted to her, and sometimes she eats milk curd. But she is the biggest political advocate of veganism outside the West, Back to Britain for our third, an MP for Bristol, home to one of the world's largest vegan festivals. I'm Kerry McCarthy. Um, I'm coming up for 20 years as a vegan. I've been an MP since 2005. The first vegan MP in Britain. I've, I've been vegetarian in total for 30 years. So I've had 10 years as a vegetarian. I had a sister who turned vegan. And to be honest, was a little bit preachy about it, and which I, I tended to sort of switch off when she... Um, sort of tried to convert me and I know it sounds absolutely ridiculous but I just then suddenly the penny dropped and I, I just thought cows were animals um, that produce milk just because that's what cows did and it was suddenly I actually started listening to her and realised that cows produced milk because there were babies involved and those babies were killed and the whole sort of cruelty of the dairy trade 
And because I'd been convinced of the logic of it, um, I actually made it a New Year's resolution. So it's coming up for 20 years this new year. So Carrie McCarthy's been vegan for 20 years. That makes her vegan as long as Ian. Exactly as long as Ian. I wasn't so, you know, to, to me, I think being vegetarian and then vegan was quite a personal thing. So it was the way I chose to do things. And I've not been, I, I've, I've recently been made a, a vice president of the League Against Cruel Sports, but I've not been as involved in animal related politics as, as Chris had. So, with so my reasons for joining the Labour Party were more on a broad range of issues, you know, sort of social justice and economic issues and, and just the general stance of the party. Um, I think I've actually become more, when I first got elected, I was a little bit reluctant to take up animal welfare issues because. I thought that it had less credibility coming from someone who was a vegan. One of our listeners asked about this. Stephen Fennec paul asked, I'm aware that when speaking out against animal cruelty, one's voice can carry less weight if one is known to be vegan. Do you think that it is better that sympathetic non-vegans lead debates in issues that are of concern to vegans? I mentioned this to Kerry. I think you just I, well, I think it's, it's good, but I, I was the first MP to have a debate in here on the links between the livestock sector and the environment damage the environment and I think my opening remarks were I'd rather it wasn't me having this debate but I've been here for a couple of years and I nobody else has, has done it um, so I think that is an issue I think the other thing though is um, we've got the annual general meeting of the um, all-party animal welfare group tomorrow afternoon and that's actually led by someone who's pro fox hunting and pro badger curl so I think you do have to be a little careful of people of politicians who pay lip service to being concerned about animal welfare but actually, you know, might be nice to dogs, but um, aren't really, don't really tick all the boxes across all the range of issues. The fourth is Dennis Kucinich, who has been vegan since 1995 and is a member of the United States Congress. And he ran for president in the last two elections. And Dennis Kucinich is a well-known pacifist. He's been against all military intervention that's come through Congress, including most recently the military intervention in Libya. And one piece of legislation that Kucinich is well known for introducing, and he's been introducing it every two years since 2001, is a Department of the Peace, which would include within it advocacy of animal rights. And among his accomplishments is that Kucinich was the youngest mayor of Cleveland. He was mayor when he was only 31. And he has a beautiful English wife, 31 years his junior, Finally, completing the British caucus, we have Cathy Jameson, who had a career in Scottish politics before winning election to the British Parliament last year. OK, I'm Cathy Jameson. I'm the Member of Parliament for Kilmarnock and Loudoun constituency in the southwest of Scotland. I was a vegetarian uh, probably for well over 20 years and then became a vegan uh, for about 15 years now. And I was very involved in the campaign against fox hunting in Scotland when the bill went through the Scottish Parliament. Well, I've been vegetarian for a number of years, but I was brought up in Ayrshire, which is a rural sort of farming area, dairy farming area in Scotland. So you can imagine what it was like at the point at which you decide that actually eating cheese and butter and uh, you know not drinking milk uh, is a big decision for somebody living in that community but I had actually didn't really enjoy those things and I'd got to the stage although I was vegetarian where my health hadn't been particularly good and when I researched a few things I realised that perhaps I could deal with some of the symptoms I was having simply by cutting out dairy produce and I did uh, then got more interested in the sort of ethical issues around it and have taken it from there. So it sounds like Kathy went from being a preference vegetarian to a health vegan and now an ethical vegan. She got involved in politics before she got involved in veganism. Well, I, I joined the Labour Party in 1979, and at that stage, um, it was much more like Kerry about the sort of social issues mm. and, and the wider um, politics. And when I went to the Scottish Parliament in 1999, I was actually asked if I would get involved with the animal welfare cross-party group there, and I chaired that for a period of time. I've looked hard for other vegans elected at their country's national level. Let us know at theveganoption.org if you think we missed anyone. But I'm going to call this, Britain has the largest vegan caucus in the world. But how much do they help each other out? Like any other group of vegans working at the same place, one important thing is to make sure the food is okay. How much do you help each other out as the three vegan MPs? Are you ever... No? I don't 
Not really. No, not really. Kerry I mean, sort of brought us together, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's been a bit My of a leader in that sense. Yeah. Yeah. So I do remember being at one breakfast meeting on one occasion yes, with Chris, indeed. famously, where you did I complain did. that oh, just having yeah. fruit wasn't enough for a no, breakfast absolutely. in the following week. Sure I said, enough, I we're, said we're extremists, sausages. but we're not that extreme. We're not fruitarians. Give us something <laughs> substantial to eat, for goodness sake. Come on, we're beyond the wit. It was the Institute of Mechanical Engineers. Actually, that has changed them. And it That's was interestingly, it was it was a it was a discussion, wasn't it, about yes. climate change, change and geoengineering solutions. And I really chided them quite severely, actually, for saying, "How can you have a a you know a symposium on on climate change and serve meat? It's just crazy! <laughs> it's like the RSPCA back in the 1970s. I think it was their first animal rights symposium that they organised, and they had veal on the menu <laughs> in the 1970s. I mean, clearly that doesn't happen anymore. Yeah. So. And I think it's just a sort of sense of solidarity that, you know, you, you know, I was the only vegan, so it was a bit feeling like, well, you're you're a bit of a weirdo in that. And if I can point to it and say, well, two you know, weirdo. there's two other weirdos, <laughs> so therefore we can't be that weird. I mean, it's actually quite funny because Kathy's replaced me in the Shadow Treasury yeah. team yeah. and sort of telling Ed Balls, the boss, that he'd got rid of one vegan and he'd got another. Because <laughs> he's never been very impressed by my veganism. It's, you've got to talk about somebody who live tweets his barbecue. Thank you to the listeners who put in questions and comments or tweets. The next show will report on the World Vegan Day debate in the British Parliament and ask the MPs your questions about how they put veganism into practice as politicians. But for World Vegan Day, we wanted to include all the vegan politicians by putting questions from other politicians to the British members of Parliament. Their questions reflect their politics. The American pacifist and Democrat, Dennis Kucinich, asked his British counterparts... Does a vegan diet so temper aggressive instincts that it creates in the individual a condition which is inhospitable to war? (laughs) Wow. Um, As you can tell by the sort of stunned silence, we're fingering that. I mean, I I suppose you could say that being vegan, you've got an enhanced sense of empathy. And compassion towards, you know, perhaps the sort of mentality that is horrified by, say, the concept of a slaughterhouse would then perhaps be more sensitive mm. to the idea of people being slaughtered mm. in military combat. But I think that's slightly dangerous territory because I'm sure there's lots of people that eat meat quite happily that are also absolutely horrified by mm. the idea of people dying in combat. So I, I think it'd be a bit difficult to sort of try to claim any sort of special viewpoint on that. I mean, we were all in Parliament, none of us were in Parliament for, say, the vote on the Iraq war, um, which I think we, I'm probably right in saying that we've all got some sort of fairly strong reservations about. But I think with Libya, it was very much presented to Parliament as the lesser of two evils in that the people of Benghazi were going to get absolutely slaughtered if there wasn't military intervention. Um, but, you know, I think at the time we thought that, you know, to, to not approve that, uh, yeah, I don't really want to speak for the other two, but I think that was a general feeling in the House of Commons, was that if we didn't support some sort of intervention, we'd be standing behind and letting a huge number of people be slaughtered. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a fair analysis. And I think my own kind of personal instincts are always to try and avoid conflict and violence mm. wherever possible, and particularly the vote on... Libya was perhaps one of the most difficult things I've had to vote on since I came to uh, Parliament here because I was very, very uneasy about much of it, but for absolutely the reasons that Kerry has described, finally uh, made me think that I would um, vote the way that I did. Mm. I mean, I think I, I you know, echo the comments of, of Kerry and, and Cathy on, on that. Um, it, it's, uh, it's certainly a difficult area, um, and, you know, it's not always an easy black and white decision. The idea that meat causes aggression goes back to Plutarch, and what's the science, Diana? Well, it's really hard to disentangle attitudes that predispose people to becoming vegetarian from actual aggressive behaviour or aggressive attitudes. Certainly it's been shown that vegetarians are more likely to have liberal, pacifist, anti-authoritarian and anti-establishment attitudes. But one reason why vegetarians might be considered less aggressive is because women are more likely to be vegetarian. However, 
the sex ratio among vegans is about 50-50. And looking at testosterone, which has been associated with aggressive tendencies, men who are vegetarian and vegan have been shown to have the same levels of testosterone as men who eat meat. So it doesn't really seem that there's any hard evidence either way. Links to the studies in the show notes at veganoption.org. Manika Gandhi, whose politics are much more strongly identified with animal issues, asked the most radical question. She said, When all the evidence by scientists points to the fact that meat eaters not only create more global warming gases, therefore imperiling the world, but also put themselves in harm's way by eating proven carcinogens, why does the government not put the same warnings on flesh that they do on cigarettes? She says all the evidence by scientists. My doctorate is in biochemistry, so my science bit now. There's a whole show in whether meat eaters always consume proven carcinogens. But the brief fact-checking I did says that vegetarians had a slightly lower cancer incidence than omnivores, but so do pescatarians. Links in the show notes at theveganoption.org. So how do the MPs answer this difficult question? <laughs> I, I actually met um, a Swedish MP recently who I think is vegetarian, not vegan, but and he'd been an MEP before that, and he's introduced a, a meat consumption bill into the Swedish Parliament, like a sort of ten minute rule bill, and um, I think I think he got a sort of fairly warm welcome. It was mostly on the environmental grounds, but I know that he had a meeting with our Minister of Farming. Who and he was quite disappointed with the response he, he got on that, which wasn't surprising. I'd warned him before that that's the sort of response he'd get. But um, I do think the the link with the environment is something that we all, as parliamentarians, really to be pushing quite a lot more. Because if you can't convince people of the ethical reasons, the compassionate reasons, I think the eth uh, the, the environmental case is strong. But I'm not sure that any of us would feel that it's quite the right time to do the equivalent of what the, the Swedish guy did and mm. bring forward a 10-minute rule bill on it because there's, you do have to establish a credibility on the issue and I, I think, um, again, it's, it's getting people who aren't vegans to also sign up, people who are known for being uh, strong environmentalists is important. Mm. And I think it's about trying to kind of build that case. Mm. You know, the meat industry, livestock industry is responsible for about 18% mm. of, of, of those emissions. and. Uh, we do need, I think, to try and sort of raise that awareness. Although the whole issue in, in, in a time of you know, austerity and um, economic uncertainty, the, the whole climate change um, issue has, has sort of fallen a little bit off the political agenda and people's kind of consciousness. And people are maybe not as concerned about that as maybe they were perhaps you know, two or three years ago. It's one of the issues that I actually raised when I first came down uh, here uh, from, you know, moved from the Scottish Parliament to Westminster and I'd raised some parliamentary questions on this. But as Chris says, you know, in a time of austerity as, mm -hmm. as well, it can be very difficult for people just to kind of make, make that leap. About 20 hours after we release this show, Kerry McCarthy will stand up in British Parliament to introduce a debate on World Vegan Day. Next show, I'll report on that debate and we'll hear more of their answers to your questions about being a vegan in politics. Our thanks to Chris Williamson, Kerry McCarthy and Kathy Jamieson of the British Parliament. And to American Congressman Dennis Kucinich and Monica Gandhi of the Indian Parliament. Please go to veganoption.org for our show notes, like us at facebook.com slash veganoption and follow Vegan Option on Twitter. And write positive reviews for us on iTunes so that we know that we're not podcasting to ourselves. If you want to know about us outside the studio, you can hear us and lots of other vegans talking about their year in veganism in Jordan Wyatt's Quirky and Fun Coexisting with Non-Human Animals at www.coexisting.co.nz. I think you mean www.coexisting.nz. <laughs> Digital media artist Rob Masters wrote our theme. I'm Diana Fleischman with Comment and Analysis. I'm Ian McDonald, reporting and producing. Copyright us. For the debate in Parliament and more vegan politics, come back to The Vegan Option. Vegan.